A woman of no importance by Oscar Wilde, first produced by Mr. Beerbohm Tree in 1893 at the Haymarket Theatre, London. Time, the present. Place, the shires. Act one, the curtain rises. We see the lawn in front of the terrace at Hunstanton Manor. Sir John and his wife, Lady Caroline Pontefract, Miss Hester Worsley, all guests of Lady Jane Hunstanton, are sitting under a large yew tree. I believe this is the first English country house you have stayed at, Miss Worsley. Yes, Lady Caroline. You have no country houses, I am told, in America? We have not many. Have you any country? What we should call country? We have the largest country in the world, Lady Caroline. They used to tell us at school that some of our states are as big as France and England put together. Ah, you must find it very drafty, I should fancy. John, you should have your muffler. What is the use of my always knitting mufflers for you if you won't wear them? I am quite comfortable, Caroline, I assure you. I think not, John. Well, you couldn't come to a more charming place than this, Miss Worsley. Though the house is excessively damp, quite unpardonably damp. And dear Lady Hunstanton is sometimes a little lax about the people she asks down here. Jane mixes too much. Lord Willingworth, of course, is a man of high distinction. It is a privilege to meet him and that member of Parliament, Mr. Kettle. Kelville, my love, Kelville. He must be quite respectable. One has never heard his name before in the whole course of one's life, which speaks volumes for a man nowadays. But Mrs. Allenby is hardly a very suitable person. I dislike Mrs. Allenby. I dislike her more than I can say. I am not sure, Miss Worsley, that foreigners like yourself should cultivate likes or dislikes about the people they are invited to meet. Mrs. Allenby is very well born. She is a niece of Lord Brancaster's. It is said, of course, that she ran away twice before she was married, but you know how unfair people often are. And I myself don't believe she ran away more than once. Mr. Arbuthnot is very charming. Oh, yes. The young man who has a post in a bank. Lady Hunstanton is most kind in asking him here, and Lord Illingworth seems to have taken quite a fancy to him. I am not sure, however, that Jane is right in taking him out of his position. In my young days, Miss Worsley, one never met anyone in society who worked for their living. It was not considered the thing. In America, those are the people we respect most. I have no doubt of it. Mr. Arbuthnot has a beautiful nature. He is so simple, so sincere. He has one of the most beautiful natures I have ever come across. It is a privilege to meet him. It is not customary in England, Miss Worsley, for a young lady to speak with such enthusiasm of any person of the opposite sex. English women conceal their feelings till after they are married. They show them then. Do you, in England, allow no friendship to exist between a young man and a young girl? We think it very inadvisable. Lady Jane Hunstanton enters followed by her footman, Francis, carrying shawls and a cushion. Jane, I was just saying what a pleasant party you have asked us to meet. You have a wonderful power of selection. It is quite a gift. Dear Carolyn, how kind of you. I think we all do fit in very nicely together. And I hope our charming American visitor will carry back pleasant recollections of our English country life. The cushion there, Francis, and my shawl. The Shetland. Get the Shetland. Francis exits in search of the Shetland shawl. Enter Gerald Arbuthnot. Lady Hunstanton, I have such good news to tell you. Lord Illingworth has just offered to make me his secretary. His secretary? That is good news indeed, Gerald. It means a very brilliant future in store for you. Your dear mother will be delighted. I really must try and induce her to come up here tonight. Oh, do you think she would, Gerald? I know how difficult it is to get her to go anywhere. Oh, I'm sure she would, Lady Hunstanton, if she knew Lord Illingworth has made me such an offer. Enter Francis the footman with a Shetland shawl. I will write and tell her about it and ask her to come up and meet him. Uh, just wait, Francis. Francis waits while Lady Hunstanton writes a letter to Gerald's mother. That is a very wonderful opening for so young a man as you are, Mr. Arbuthnot. It is indeed, Lady Caroline. I trust I shall be able to show myself worthy of it. I trust so. 
You have not congratulated me yet, Miss Worsley. Are you very pleased about it? Of course I am. It means everything to me. Things that were out of the reach of hope before may be within hope's reach now. Nothing should be out of the reach of hope. Life is a hope. I fancy, Caroline, that diplomacy is what Lord Illingworth is aiming at. I heard that he was offered Vienna, but that may not be true. I don't think that England should be represented abroad by an unmarried man, Jane. It might lead to complications. You are too nervous, Caroline. Believe me, you are too nervous. Besides, Lord Illingworth may marry any day. I was in hopes he would have married Lady Kelso, but I believe he said her family was too large. Or was it her feet? I forget which. I regret it very much. She was made to be an ambassador's wife. She certainly has a wonderful faculty of remembering people's names and forgetting their faces. Well, that is very natural, Caroline, is it not? I have written a line to your dear mother, Gerald, to tell her your good news and to say she really must come to dinner. Francis, tell Henry to wait for an answer. Francis exits. That is awfully kind of you, Lady Hunstanton. Will you come for a stroll, Miss Worsley? With pleasure. Hester exits with Gerald. I am very much gratified at Gerald Arbuthnot's good fortune. He is quite a protege of mine. And I am particularly pleased that Lord Illingworth should have made the offer of his own accord without my suggesting anything. Nobody likes to be asked favors. I remember poor Charlotte Pagden making herself quite unpopular one season because she had a French governess she wanted to recommend to everyone. I saw the governess, Jane. Lady Pagden sent her to me. It was before Eleanor came out. She was far too good looking to be in any respectable household. I don't wonder Lady Pagden was so anxious to get rid of her. Ah, that explains it. John? The grass is too damp for you. You had better go and put on your overshoes at once. I am quite comfortable, Caroline, I assure you. You must allow me to be the best judge of that, John. Pray do as I tell you. Sir John gets up and goes off. You spoil him, Caroline, you do indeed. Enter Mrs. Allenby with Lady Stutfield. Well, my dears, I hope you like the park. It is said to be well timbered. The trees are wonderful, Lady Hunstanton. Quite, quite wonderful. But somehow, I feel sure that if I lived in the country for six months, I should become so unsophisticated that no one would take the slightest notice of me. I assure you, dear, that the country has not that effect at all. Why, it was from Melthorpe, which is only two miles from here, that Lady Belton eloped with Lord Feathersdale. I remember the occurrence perfectly. Poor Lord Belton died three days afterwards of joy or, or gout. I forget which. We had a very large party staying here at the time, so we were all very much interested in the whole affair. I think to elope is cowardly. It's running away from danger, and danger has become so rare in modern life. As far as I can make out, the young women of the present day seem to make it the sole object of their lives to be always playing with fire. The one advantage of playing with fire, Lady Caroline, is that one never gets even singed. It is the people who don't know how to play with it who get burned up. Yes, I see that. It is very, very helpful. I don't know how the world would get on with such a theory as that, dear Mrs. Allenby. Ah, the world was made for men and not for women. Oh, don't say that, Lady Stutfield. We have a much better time than they have. There are far more things forbidden to us than are forbidden to them. Yes, that is quite, quite true. I had not thought of that. Enter Sir John and Mr. Kelville. Well, Mr. Kelville, have you got through your work? I have finished my writing for the day, Lady Hunstanton. Oh, it has been an arduous task. The demands on the time of a public man are very heavy nowadays. Very heavy indeed. And I don't think they meet with adequate recognition. John, have you got your overshoes on? Yes, my love. I think you had better come over here, John. It is more sheltered. I am quite comfortable, Caroline. I think not, John. You had better sit beside me. Sir John rises and goes to sit by his wife. And what have you been writing about this morning, Mr. Kelville? On the usual subject, Lady Studfield, on purity. That must be such a very, very interesting thing to write about. 
It is the one subject of really national importance nowadays, Lady Studfield. I purpose addressing my constituents on the question before Parliament meets. I find that the poor classes of this country display a marked desire for a higher ethical standard. How quite, quite nice of them. Are you in favor of women taking part in politics, Mr. Kettle? Kettleville, my dear, Kettleville. The growing influence of women is the one reassuring thing in our political life, Lady Caroline. Women are always on the side of morality, public and private. It is so very, very gratifying to hear you say that. Ah, uh, yes. The moral qualities in women, that is the important thing. I'm afraid, Caroline, that dear Lord Illingworth doesn't value the moral qualities in women as much as he should. Enter Lord Illingworth. The world says that Lord Illingworth is very, very wicked. But what world says that, Lady Studfield? It must be the next world. This world and I are on excellent terms. Everyone I know says that you are very, very wicked. <laughs> it is perfectly monstrous the way people go about nowadays, saying things against one behind one's back that are absolutely and entirely true. <laughs> Dear Lord Illingworth is quite hopeless, Lady Stutfield. I have given up trying to reform him. It would take a public company with a board of directors and a paid secretary to do that. Uh, but you have the secretary already, Lord Illingworth, haven't you? Gerald Arbuthnot has told us of his good fortune. It is really most kind of you. No, oh, don't say that, Lady Hunstanton. Kind is a dreadful word. 